Our scripture lesson this morning uh, comes from Acts chapter 1. I think I'm just going to read the, the first passage. I'm not going to read the, the Acts 19 passage. I'll just refer to it. So we'll just go with the Acts chapter 1. I'll be reading verses 1 through, uh, actually I'm just going to read 1 through 9. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. Let me, let me just pause as I read this. Uh, it says Jesus began. Didn't say that he finished. See, our sermon series is on doing what Jesus did. So Jesus is still continuing to do things. Hallelujah. Even this morning, he began doing things, uh, and he's continuing to do things through his people. Amen? So we're learning to do what Jesus did. After his suffering, Jesus showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Last Sunday, as I preached uh, in, in this series, Doing What Jesus Did, we gave an invitation at the end of the message about uh, if, you, if, you, if you were to die today, do you know where you would be? Would you be with Jesus? Yeah. And in response to that, I said, uh, uh, would you like to know for sure? If you can't answer that, would you like to know for sure? And the response was very good last Sunday. So if you were here, you will remember that there was a lot of people stood up. Some of them were rededicating their hearts and lives. Some of them had, had uh, needed to, to know for sure, and they wanted to make that step of faith in regards to what Jesus had said. If you confess me before men, I will, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. And so we gave an opportunity for that. And you, many of you stood up, some of you, for the very first time and received Christ. I, I want to just say in another announcement along with that, in three weeks, on March the 5th, we're going to have a baptism service during our morning services. And so if you want to be immersed, ba- immersed in baptism, uh, we're going to do that in our morning service. So keep that in the back of your mind, and that will be coming up in three weeks. Uh, we're going to do that on March the 5th uh, in both services. And, and, of course, baptism is simply a symbol of what, what had just happened. Baptism is a symbol of our death and burial and then resurrection into new life. This morning, I, I, that's the direction I want us to go. I want us to understand something here, that, that when, we, when we received Christ, we were dying to our old self, and we were raised into new life, and I'm going to show you in a few minutes uh, what that looked like or my concept of how that worked, but we've been raised into new life, our sins were forgiven, we, were, we became brand new creation in Christ, according to uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. That's not a metaphor. That's not an allegory. That is literally what happens. The Holy Spirit unites with your spirit, and you become a new creature. Yes, sir. Well, you still look the same, still smell the same. You still, you still have to, you still uh, take a shower in the morning. You still, uh, you're, you still have the same personality. 
but in your spirit, something has radically changed, and it's changing and transforming you. You've begun a journey. Something has happened on the inside. It's beginning to affect your mind, your will, your emotions, your personality. It even affects your body. That's called the new birth. And, in me, and, and what an incredible thing that is that took place, that when you put your faith and trust in Jesus and not in your own good works and in your own efforts, but when you put your faith totally and only in Jesus, your sins were forgiven. The blood of Jesus washed away all your sins. Yes, you are completely uh, atoned for and redeemed. Uh, there's not a partial. It's a whole Activity, a whole action that took place all under the blood of Jesus. He's your Savior this morning, and you have been forgiven. But there's more. You see, it's not just about what you've been saved from, it's about what you've been saved to. Last Sunday was about what you were saved from. You were saved from death. You were saved from the wrath of God. You were saved from an eternity separated from God in hell. You were saved, you were saved from your sins because of what Jesus did for you. Not what you did, but what he did for you. You were saved from. But this morning, I want to tell you the full gospel. I want to tell you what you were saved from. Two. Now, this morning's message, I want to tell you right off the bat, 90%, and I'm just spitballing here, but 90% of the churches in the United States, you won't hear this message in. Oh, they, they may preach the gospel, and many of them do, I'm sure. Uh, they tell you what you're saved from, but, but as to what you're saved to, I'm not so sure you're going to hear that in very many. And, and in Methodist churches, it's probably 95 to 90 or 98 to 99 percent. You won't hear this message about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. That we, that we are saved to the Holy Spirit. Saved to the power of the. We've been saved to the gift that the Father promised. We've been saved to something. You see, the full gospel is this. It begins with forgiveness of sins. And you've been forgiven. And wow, I'm not wanting to diminish that one bit, but that's just one part of it. The, the full gospel also includes healing, that we've been healed as far as the, the ravages and the wounds of sin. He, that's also part of the gospel message is healing of, of the wounds of sin. Not only that, but we've also in salvation is, is, is victory and power to overcome. You see, I, I, I'm, I'm convinced that too many times people, people get saved, they, they receive forgiveness, they invite and make Jesus their personal Savior, and then they sit down. It's like, it's like the story I read about a little boy that uh, fell out of bed during the night, and he must have caused quite a crash. And then, of course, he was crying. His dad come running into the, into the room, and he said, what happened? And what happened? And the little boy said, I, I, I think I fell asleep too close to where I got in. <laughs> I was going to say, think about it, but you, it sounds like you already got it. So, sometimes we fall asleep too close to where we got in. And we've not gone on. This morning's about going on. It's about going deeper. It's about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Not only that, but the full gospel also includes fulfillment and purpose. Why are you here? What has God got in mind? You're not here by accident. God's got a purpose for your life. You're not. He didn't save you just to, for, just to populate heaven. He, 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 can, he already populated heaven with the angels that he created. He redeemed you, though, not to populate heaven only. He redeemed you for a purpose. 
He bought you with the blood of his own son. Your life is not your own. You belong to him now. The full gospel involves also means a partnership. Through the Holy Spirit, a partnership to destroy the works of the devil. Again, folks, I'm talking about falling asleep too close to where we got in. And when we do that, we're not destroying the works of the devil anymore. And when we do that, the church becomes irrelevant. When we do that, we're just taking up time, wasting people's time, and we are vulnerable and susceptible to falling away unless we move on. Unless we move on in the spiritual battle. Let me tell you my story. I shared my story last week with you at the end there of how I came to know, know the Lord and gave made a commitment. I, at a very early age, I, I was sensitive to things of the Lord. I, I grew up in a preacher's home. Couldn't help it. <laughs> I, was, I was drugged to church every time the doors were open. And... Uh, uh, and I, I grew up in church. I can't remember anything else but church when I, uh, as a boy. But it wasn't, and, but that wasn't necessarily a positive, uh, as I shared last week, because what happened was I learned how to play the game. I, I learned how to pretend. I learned how to, how to just go through the motions and, and not make the commitment. But finally, the Lord zeroed in. He got my attention. He zeroed in when I was in high school. And, and, and in, a, in a specific service that I was involved in, uh, and, and the Lord zeroed in on me, uh, I knew it was time to quit playing the game. I knew it was time to get serious with the Lord. And I knew it was t- that he was talking directly to me. And at that time, I made a commitment to the Lord, and I never looked back. It was about that same time, in fact, it was that following summer when he called me to be a preacher, to be a pastor, to go to serve him full time. But it was all, he was waiting on me to make that step. Well, I I went on into, uh, to move in that direction of becoming a a pastor and I graduated from high school and and went off to college where uh, I met my wife and Beth and I got married and and, uh, after the second year of college, uh, I got appointed as a student uh, to be a pastor, a student pastor in Bluffton, Ohio, okay? Uh, That was my first church. It was called Bluffton Trinity, by the way. I, I've been in Trinities all the time. Trinity, <laughs> Trinity Bluffton, Trinity Van Wert, and now Trinity Pickerington. Uh, the pattern there, I think. But at my first church, it was, it was amazing because I was 20 years old. I had just turned 20 that summer, and, uh, and I knew everything. <laughs> Man, I, I was so smart. I, I had it all together. And, and I look back at those, we had about 50, 60 people in that congregation, and I think, oh, Lord, have mercy. What did I, what did I do to those people? But, but in that, in that uh, church that I started pastoring, uh, I noticed something really different uh, that I'd not seen before, but I'd heard a little bit about it. And there was, a, there was a little handful of people in that congregation who were weird. Uh, I, I'd call them up and they'd say, praise the Lord, this is Merle, praise the Lord, this is, you know, and, and, it was, and I thought, how can anybody be that happy? This is nuts. And then it dawned on me, oh, I know. Those are some of those tongue-speaking charismatics. I sized them up, I knew. And a 20-year-old pastor, I knew, I knew. In fact, what that happened was, I determined nobody was going to know more about the Holy Spirit than me. That's a dangerous thing to do. In fact, I, I look back at it now and I think this is a setup. And the Lord was setting me up. Because I determined, I, and I started reading books. I got a hold of some books, you know, 9 o'clock in the morning by Dennis Bennett. They Spake with Other Tongues by John and Elizabeth Sherrill. I, I mean, I was reading all these stuff by Kenneth and, and Kenneth Hagen and Kenneth Copeland and Copenhagen and everybody else. I mean, I was just, I was reading this stuff and I was thinking, what in the world? I'd never seen this stuff before. About that same time, my best friend, he'd been the best man in my wedding and I and his, uh, came home from uh, college. He was at uh, Ohio State University. 
And his name, Mark Wolf, Mark, uh, had gotten a part of a, a Bible study fellowship uh, uh, somewhere on campus or somewhere in Columbus uh, that was being led by Pat Melcher and Dottie Geary. See, see I, I had connections to Trinity long before I set foot in this building. And Dottie and, and Pat uh, discipled Mark, led him into the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And Mark came home from college, from the university, and, and he said, hey, guess what happened to me? And he began telling me this stuff, and, and of course, I, I'd been reading, and I knew what to say. And I said, okay, well, show me in the Bible, how in the world did this, you know, show me, is this biblical? Does God still do this sort of thing? And, and I just went after him with everything I had. Every time he'd come home on the weekends, he and I'd go round and round uh, on this. And, and, and what is this stuff? What, what is this stuff that you're, is, is this from God? Uh, why have I never heard this before? Okay. Well, as I was reading, uh, I, it, it, it began to bother me a lot to the point where I wasn't eating and sleeping very good. This went on for about two months. Finally, well, let me back up for just a moment. Mark was coming home that weekend, and, and uh, that before on Friday, must have been Thursday or Friday, I ran into the hospital in, in Lima, Ohio, and uh, to visit somebody. And on the way home, back to Ada, Ohio, where I was, Beth and I had an apartment, we were, I was attending Ohio, Ohio Northern University. As I was in the car, and I was thinking about all this, and, and, and trying to figure all this stuff out, I said, all right. If, if this stuff is from God, and there really is such a thing as the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and if this speaking in tongues business is for real, I'm going to speak in tongues right now. And I started, bum, ba, 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 ba. And then I thought, that was the stupidest thing I ever did in my life. How could I be so idiotic? What a dumb thing to do. Now, there was nobody else in the car, but I was, I was saying this all out loud as if I was trying to cover my embarrassment. The very next night, Mark came over to the apartment, and he began to share with me, and, and, and I started in on him. And, and finally, at a certain point, he raised his hand. He said, look, he said, you're asking the same questions over and over again. And he said, I think you really desire this in your heart. And I thought for a moment, and I thought, you know what? He's right. I said, what do I do? He says, well, just kneel down here on the carpet in our apartment. He said, I'm going to put my hand on your head. I'm going to pray over you, and you're going to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I said, okay. That's what I did. And, you know, he put his hand on my head, and I began to pray and and. And you know what? The very first syllables that came out of the mo my mouth were the very same ones I had spoken in the car the day before. And I recognized. And then, then it hit me. I started laughing. And the laughter, it just was like a, it was like a release out of my stomach, out of my belly. And I just rolled on the floor just laughing because the joy of the Lord just took a hold just took a hold of me. Listen to me this morning. I shared that story with you because I not only want us to know what he saved us from, but I want you to know what he's saving us to. We're living in a day and age in which the spiritual battle is intensifying. It, it, it's sort of like Okay, last Sunday, and, and if you prayed the prayer, you know Jesus as your Savior, you're in the army now, okay? You've been sworn in, you got the in uniform, they took your picture, you've read the instruction manual, you've even gone through boot camp and training, and you're all in, but you don't have any weapons. You don't have any weapons. Until you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Because you see, that's the key. When we understand what we've been saved to, that baptism, Jesus, there was a reason why Jesus said, don't leave Jerusalem. 
don't leave Jerusalem until, he said, wait, 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 wait until you receive power from on high, the gift that my father promised. If you try to live the Christian life without the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll mess it up. In fact, it's impossible. Oh, I, you, you can be, uh, you, can, you can pretend. You can go through the motions. You can, you can do a lot of good stuff. But you won't be fulfilling his purpose and his calling. Because in order to do that, you've got to have the baptism of the Spirit. You've got to have the promise from the Father. You've got to have that power from on high. Then you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, at home. How many, how many of us want to be a, a witness in our home? How many of us want to be a witness at the work? How many of us want to be a better witness in our community? How many of us want to be a part of a church that is shining brightly in this community? Not irrelevant. I don't want them driving by the church and say, oh, yeah, that's that, ch that's that weird church over there on the corner. No, 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 no. I want them to know. I want them to know that's a church that believes in healing. I'm, I want them to know that's a church that does what Jesus did. I want them to know that that's a church that has, that's got the, arms, the, uh, the armor of God. I want them to know that the enemy is threatened by this band of believers. Because we're learning to do what Jesus did. And, Lord, and, and in order to do that, we've got to have, we've got to have the baptism, the the Spirit's power to be able to carry that. John Wesley, founder of Methodism, listen to this quote by Wesley. He said, he said, I'm not afraid that the people called Methodists should ever cease to exist either in Europe or America, but I am afraid lest they should only exist as a dead sect, having the form of religion without the power. Do you understand? Do you, do you understand why it's not, this is not being taught in our seminaries and why many preachers don't preach on this? So it, there's, a, there's a doctrine, I, I believe it's a false doctrine called cessationism. Cessationism, and, and by the way, it, cessationism has permeated our, our nation and our seminaries and our churches yeah. for, for probably 200 years or more. So it's very strong. This false doctrine of cessation. Basically, what they, ba what they teach is that they believe that the, the uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit ceased yeah. when the last apostle died. And that they are not for today. Seriously, that's a, that's a strong doctrine. It's taught. Uh, and and, and even, if, even if we don't believe that doctrine anymore functionally sometimes we live as if the Holy Spirit is not for today listen whatever, whatever we're facing today or in the days ahead we need the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit to be able to win the battle Without that supernatural power of the Holy Spirit, without the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we're not going to be effective. We're going to lose more than we gain. We're going to be defeated by the enemy over and over again. Do you understand how important it is that we know that we receive and that we know the power of the Holy Spirit? In Luke chapter 11, verses 9 through 13, Jesus said, Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. And then he, then he talks, he goes on to say, he said, if, if, a, if your child 
uh, asks his father uh, for bread, will the father give him a stone? No. If he asks for fish, will the father give him a scorpion? No. And then Jesus says, and if you ask for the Holy Spirit, your father will give it because your father is a good father. Do you understand that Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit? Let, let, me, let me use, uh, can, can we still do those diagrams? Let, let me explain. Let me give you the picture of the, of the diagrams, and then, then we're going to pray. But these, these diagrams help explain what, I, what happened last week and what I'm talking about today. This, this is a concept, concept uh, a picture of, of the unregenerated, unsaved person. They have a body, obviously. They have a mind, will, and emotion. That's their soul. That's their personality. But they are, their spirit is dead. They're separated from God. And because of sin, they are separated from God, and they are spiritually dead. Now, how do they operate? Well, they look alive. <laughs> they act alive. Their mind, their will, and emotion, that's called uh, their, their soul or their flesh, still operates, still makes decisions, still, still conducts their life. Some people live from birth to death exactly like that. Exactly like that. But let's see the second picture. The second one, though, this is what happens when you got saved. Now, your body stays the same uh, for the most part. Your mind, will, and emotions, your soul, your personality, uh, Oftentimes, you, you, don't, you don't become somebody else that way. You're still, but what has happened is your spirit has come alive. Your spirit has been, has been invaded by the Holy Spirit. When you invited Jesus to come into your life, the Holy Spirit came into your spirit. You became alive. And in fact, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, you became a brand new creation. Oh, you still look the same. You still sound the same. But you are not the same. Hallelujah. You are not the same. Does that mean that you don't make mistakes anymore? Oh, no, you make lots of mistakes. I'm sure you still flub the dub. I still, you still sin. You still, you know, your mind, will, and emotions need to be renewed by the Word of God. And that's a process. That's a journey. But... But inside, in your spirit, you are a brand new creature. You, are a, you have experienced the new birth. You've experienced the new birth, and it is a miracle from God. But now, what I'm talking about this morning is the third slide. Baptism in the Holy Spirit is when the, the Holy Spirit in your spirit flows out. In other words, you don't get more Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit gets more of you. And the Holy Spirit over transcends, overflows your mind, your will, and emotion. That's how come, that's how come uh, in your mind, the, uh, you, you can have the Holy Spirit can give you words of knowledge that there's no way you, your mind, your intellect could have known that. But the Holy Spirit supernaturally gave you that information. The Holy Spirit flows out of your spirit over your mind, your intellect, your will, even your emotions. He brings healing. He, br he gives gifts. And he even your body. The Holy Spirit begins to flow. And the, uh, in the baptism in the Holy Spirit, it's like what Jesus said in John chapter 7, 38. Out of your inmost being flows rivers of living water. And he was talking about the Holy Spirit. John even says that. He was talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit begins to flow. When we get baptized in the Holy Spirit, that's exactly what happens. But as always, we have a tendency to leak. And so in Ephesians chapter 5, it says that be ye filled with the Spirit. And what that means is continuous action. 
that sometimes we, we, get, we get all caught up in all the busyness and cares of this world and we fail to walk in that victory, walk in that power, walk in that spirit-filled uh, uh, power in our daily life is learning to walk in that power and set that destroys the work of the enemy. Part of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, I believe, gives, includes in that package not only spiritual gifts, supernatural gifts, but it's also the supernatural gift of tongues. It also involves the, the, the prayer language, to be able to pray in an unknown, un, unlearned language that the Spirit gives you to be able to pray according to the will of God. I believe that's part. Now, I, I know people that are baptized in the Holy Spirit. They're spirit-filled, and they have not had a release of their prayer language. And there's all kinds of reasons for that, I suppose. But, but I believe it is part of the package, part of what God wants to give. You see, he wants us to be armed. He wants us to know how to pray. He wants us to be able to do battle against the enemy. Paul says, he said, I pray with my mind and I pray in the spirit. I sing with my mind and I sing with my spirit. It's both. In order to be able to walk and to, to uh, accomplish that purpose of God in partnership of the Holy Spirit to destroy the works of the enemy. This gift of the Holy Spirit is what I'm talking about this morning. So this morning, as we close this message, this is the way I want to do that. I want to give you an opportunity, just like we did last week, with an opportunity for you to, to answer that question and to respond. I want to give you an opportunity to respond this morning. That if you would like to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, or maybe you have the need to be released in your prayer language, You've been baptized in the Holy Spirit a long time ago, but you, you've not been exercising the gifts of the Spirit, that supernatural work. Listen, I'm not talking about the natural. I'm talking about the supernatural. Yes. That, that God wants us to learn to operate in. Listen, it's going to be more important than ever before in the days ahead. I really believe that. We're in a spiritual battle. It's not political. It's not economic, it's spiritual. You don't believe me on that? Just take a look at how much anger, how much vitriol, how much violence. I mean, this is, this is not, this is not natural at all. There, there, is, there is a huge battle taking place. And as, as, Believers, we need to understand that. We need to understand it's more than just going to heaven someday. It's more than just the glory bus pulling up and we get on board and go off to heaven someday. It's more than that. It's about what are we saved to in order to change and transform this world, in order to destroy, in order to destroy the works of the devil through healing, through deliverance, setting people free, through miracles. See, I, I really think this is where Trinity needs to go. I really think this is what God is calling forth in the church today. As your pastor, there's a lot of things. You know, I get emails all the time and mailings all the time about, well, if you, you know, if you, if you really want to have a, a great worship time, you need a smoke machine and you need flashing lights. That's what we need, Ben. We need more of that. Or if we want to have, if we want to have a, oh, I was looking in the wrong direction. I should have been looking up there. If you, if you really want people to feel welcome and, high, and, and to the church, we need people with umbrellas out in the parking lot to help people get in the church, you know. We need this sales campaign. We need this marketing plan. We need, and listen, I shouldn't make fun of it. Those things are all okay. 
But there is nothing, nothing that man can create that compares with the supernatural moving of God's Spirit. You see, that's how the early church within one generation turned the Roman world upside down. It wasn't through gimmicks. It wasn't through mailings. It was through miracles and signs and wonders. By the way, the whole world is waiting for this. The Islamic world doesn't have this. Most of the Christian world doesn't even pay attention to this. But I believe the Lord is raising this up now. I want to invite the elders and our altar ministry team. If you'd come up and stand across the front here. And if you'd like to have prayer to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 19, the apostle Paul went to the church in Ephesus. found the people in Ephesus. He said, he said have, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And the people said, well, we haven't even heard of the Holy Spirit. What are you talking about? Paul says, well, you need to be baptized in Jesus' name. And then it says he laid hands on them. That's all they're going to do is they're just going to lay hands on you and impart. You know, see, the Holy Spirit wants to do this. It's not us. We just simply lay hands and let the Lord do what the Lord wants to do. If you would like to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if you'd like to be released and and, and to receive your prayer language. If you'd like to see this, the gifts of the Holy Spirit come forth in your life more and more, I invite you to come right now. Just come right now. Lord, come. Holy Spirit, come. As we come to press in before you, Lord, impart your Holy Spirit. Impart the baptism. Give the gift that you want to give. We don't want to be with, we don't want to go forth from here. We don't want to leave Jerusalem until we've received the power from on high. So Lord, come. Fall upon us now in Jesus' name.